Welcome to church. Welcome to Sunday School. It's good to see you out. I appreciate you coming out this morning as we continue to talk about what it's like to be a disciple of Christ. <clears throat> We've talked about how he chose the disciples, and then we talked a little bit about the cost of being a disciple. And I made the mistake of when we were talking about or teaching on the cost of discipleship, I thought I was being brilliant by going ahead and talking about some scripture that I thought would be um, pertinent. Not to know that it was today's scripture. So <laughs> now I've got to teach you something different with the scripture that I used two weeks ago. No, not really. It's a, it's a different, di different uh, way we're going to go about this today with instructions because we're going to talk about what Jesus did when he... There was a reason that he chose these 12. And we've talked about that for several weeks. He, he knew that his time was short and that when he did go away and ascend back to his father that these 12 individuals were going to be the ones that were going to... Um, he was going to plant the seed and they were going to water it and it was going to flourish. And these 12 individuals were going to be the ones that would turn the world upside down, as they say. And, and in today's lesson, he's going to give them instructions about what he expects of them. You know, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to follow me. There's a reason why I've chosen you. There's a reason why I have you follow me. There's a reason why we're living together, traveling together, eating together. There's a reason why. And now he's going to tell them. And it's a tough, uh, it's a tough command because these guys, they, they have to know that their lives as they knew it are now going to be over. The lives that they may have planned for themselves and their families, and you know, they may have been looking at what am I, you know, their occupation at some point, you know, success and retirement and all of that, that's, that's over now. These guys, their lives are laid out, and Jesus is telling them, I've got a command to, for you, instructions for the rest of your life, and here they are. And, uh, and some of them you'd think that uh, would be discouraged to hear some of the things that Christ is telling them he, he commands them to do. Uh, before we get into the lesson, let's go to the Lord in prayer, thanking him for his goodness. If you have any requests or anything that you'd like the body to, to hear, please let, us, please let us know. Lee, remember Lee with his heart. Another, all right. James's family, yes. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just pray for the church in general and all of us as we go through the life's way. Father, we come to you this morning. As always, we are thankful, God, that we have an opportunity to gather as believers in this local assembly. You have given us a building to gather in, Lord, that we can learn from your word and we can lift your name up and praise and we can just worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. And God, we come to you at this point in this day, Lord, that we would bring up uh, this church and the people in it and the requests that you've heard, Lord, up to your throne, God, to ask for your blessings to be poured out upon all of us, God, as we go through life's way. In these tumultuous times, God, that we live in, Lord, I pray that you would continue to give us peace of heart and peace of mind to know that everything is under your control, under your care. As we're going to learn today, Lord, every hair of our head is numbered, Lord, and you know the number of it. And Lord, we take solace and peace in knowing that you, Father, know everything about us more than we know of ourselves, God. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We can lay our heads down at night knowing, God, that we are in your care no matter what would, be ha what would happen the next day. I ask you, Lord, this morning, Lord, that you would help me, Lord, to, to teach this lesson on instructions for those that choose to be disciples of Christ. Help us, Lord, to have a desire and a heart, and a heart to go after into the world, Lord, to be disciples better than we have been in the past, God. Just have, give us the desire, once again, to spread your word, Lord, through our life and through our word. I pray for these things in Jesus' name. We give you thanks for it all, as always. Amen. Instructions for Christian Disciples. It's taken out of the 10th chapter of Matthew. It's where we're going to spend our entire lesson this morning. Um, and this is here again. You have to picture yourself of where, if you're one of these 12 disciples or one of the many multitudes that were following Christ, you have to understand where we are in the picture. Jesus has just come out of doing multiple miracles, healing miracles. Uh, they would bring people to him uh, that were, were sick, and, and, and he would heal them right there in front of your eyes as a disciple. You would hear this marvelous teaching, and all of a sudden, he's going to gather you together after he has chosen 12 of you. He's going to gather you together. In the chapter 10 of Matthew, Matthew is, dep is depicting a situation where he's just chosen the 12, and he's immediately letting them know why he's chosen them instead of the multitudes that, that may have that, that may have been um, 
following him around. He had multi multiple people who wanted to be around him and follow him and hear his teaching and, and spread the gospel, but he chose these 12. And I'll pick up in verse 5 um, to, to tell you where we are. It says, These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them. He didn't ask them. He didn't suggest it. He commanded. This may have been the first time that Jesus commanded other than when he said, Come, follow me. He commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Now you have to understand, he's, he's got these 12 and he's telling them to go. I'm going to send you out. Okay, so we're ready to go. But he's giving them some limitations. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not. Samaritans, of course, was named for the city of Samaria, which, Samaria, which was originally the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Do not go in the way of Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want you to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles yet. Don't go to the Samaritans, which had intermarried into with Gentiles. That's why the Jews hated Samaritans, as they called them half-breeds, because they would intermarry with Gentile people. But he tells us to go and he tells them to go into the house and to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's an interesting terminology because Israel for hundreds of years had not existed. Remember Israel, Samaritan was, or Samaria was the capital of, is, of Israel. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Remember the southern kingdom. And then when the Assyrian army came and sacked Samaria and took over and dispersed all the, uh, the Israelites out of the nation of Israel at that time, Israel stopped being a nation. Then Rome comes in and takes over years later. And so Israel hadn't been a nation in years, decades. But yet Christ is saying, I want you to go into the lost tribes of Israel. Now Israel, of course, they knew exactly their history. They knew that Israel was the name of Jacob and his 12 sons. So they are going after the Jews. That's what Jesus is saying. We know that later Paul is going to come on the scene and be the the apostle to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. The disciples don't know this yet. There's 12 Jews themselves, and Jesus is saying, stay amongst the Jews. Stay here, and this is what I want you to preach. So he gets into your lesson text in verse 7 <clears throat> by saying, "I got here's the message you're going to preach to these people. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's going to be your message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Most of the Jews that they would be talking to were expecting Messiah to come and establish a kingdom here on earth. The Israeli kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, which would conquer and reign and, and overthrow Rome. Remember that? They wanted to, they, they believed their Messiah was going to come and bring them back to a powerful nation here on earth. Jesus' message is you're going to preach the gospel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this kingdom of heaven, when we study it out, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. He doesn't say the kingdom of Israel is at hand. It's the kingdom of heaven, meaning that this is spiritual. When he's in front of Pilate, Pilate asked him, are you a king? And he says, "If I, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of heaven, and I've brought the kingdom of heaven to this earth, and it is at hand. It is here. It's not only a spiritual kingdom, but it's a kingdom made up that where you've got to enter. In order to enter it, you've got to be born again, as he would tell Nicodemus. To be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be born into it, born again. And he had that wonderful conversation with Nicodemus. So the disciples are having to preach about this spiritual kingdom is at hand. It's a kingdom of God, a kingdom of heaven, and you have to be born again to enter into it. And it's the kingdom of the heart. It's not of citizenship. It's not papers that you fill out. It's not any one place that you have to live in. It's a kingdom of the heart. You can live anywhere and be a part of this kingdom. You can live in different countries and be a part of this kingdom because it's spiritual and it's of inside the body, not outside. It's of the heart. This is the message that the disciples are having to preach about what kingdom they're preaching about. It's the same thing that Jesus did when he was teaching and preaching on the earth is that this kingdom is not of this earth. This is the one that if you want eternity... You have to belong to this kingdom because the kingdom I'm preaching on has eternal uh, rewards. Along with teaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he tells them what they're going to do. Now here again, 
Think of yourself as one of these chosen 12. After seeing all that you've seen with Jesus, all the miracles, all the lessons, and here's what you're going to do as you preach. You're going to heal the sick. You're going to cleanse the lepers. You're going to raise the dead. Think about that. Me, Scott Leonard, disciple. You're going to raise the dead. <laughs> Cast out devils. Freely you have received and freely you're going to give. Powerful statement here if you're a disciple and your master is telling you. A disciple here again is someone who is learning. You're following a master. You're learning with them. If you're an apostle, you're sent with authority and power. You've been given the power and the authority to act as your master acted and do the things that your master has taught you to do. These gentlemen are disciples. They will be called apostles because Jesus has given them the power and the authority to do these very things that we're reading about. If we were in that time period and we were one of the disciples, as fearful as we may be, as unsure of ourselves as we may have been, which is natural, Jesus is telling us that he's given us the power and authority to do the very things we've seen him do. So they know that he's, he's giving them the understanding that you're going to have to trust me and trust the Holy Spirit that's going to be in you, giving you this power to do this. And here again, the Holy Spirit had not failed yet, as we know the Holy Spirit to come down. You know, he is giving, Christ himself, which is on the earth, has given them the power and the authority. When Christ ascends back to heaven, the Holy Spirit will come forth and give the power and the authority. Jesus is doing that here. So he's telling them this is what we're going to do. But then he says something that's even possibly more discouraging to them. They're ready to go and preach the gospel, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses or in your money belts. In other words, take no money with you and ask for no money. You're not going to take anything with you and you're not going to ask for anything uh, from your work from your preaching, from anything else. You're going to re rely totally on the Lord to provide for you. Now, this can be even more discouraging to these disciples who have come from occupations. They've all had jobs. They know that they need money to survive. They know what they do with their money and things of this nature. And Jesus is telling me, I'm going to send you out to preach the gospel. You're going to do these wonderful things. But you can't take money and you can't ask for money because freely you receive this authority and power and freely you're going to give it out. You didn't pay for this and you're not going to ask for money for it. You're just going to give it freely. Nor script for your journey. You're not going to take a bag. A script is a type of bag. You're not going to take provisions with you. No food, no extra clothing, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet even your staves. Now in the book of Mark... Uh, Mark comes back later and is, is given an example of this same story. And he says, you can take the staff that you have, a walking stick. But he is saying you're not going to take uh, extra, anything extra. For the workman is worthy of his meat. He's worthy of his meat. You're going to go into these cities and these towns preaching the gospel, but you're going to be, you're going to um, inundate yourself into that community and you're going to rely upon those that, have, that will take you in and provide, but you're going to work for what they give you. And it's not going to be from the spiritual sense. You're going to get in there and you're going to work with your hands and you're going to earn your way as you go. This is not going to be a point where you say that I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm a local evangelist and I'm here to spread, teach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And here's the cost that it's going to take you to, uh, to learn of it. I always get frustrated. I'm sure you do too. You'll you'll um, you'll read an article or something on on your phone, and it'll say, you know, uh, the one food that you should eat that'll cure all diseases. And you read and read and read and read, and it's given all this stuff. And at the very end, you can buy my book for 19.99 and find out what it is. You've just wasted all your time reading the advertisement. So you know, if they would, if they truly wanted you to know if they truly loved you <laughs> and wanted you to eat that one food that would cure all your diseases they would freely tell you but no you gotta you gotta pay for it jesus is saying that you're going to go and you're going to preach the gospel you're going to work in amongst them you're going to earn your living and you're going to you're going to allow god to provide for your needs but everything spiritual you're going to give freely 
you're not going to take anything with you. I remember we went on a trip one time and um, we went on a, um, a, a mission trip to Uruguay. And we were there building a, a church and, and in the middle of this town called Mercedes, um, we were working with the locals and two Mormon gentlemen walked up on us with their white shirts, black pants and, uh, and their ties. And they walked up, they had, you know, if you know anything about what Mormons do, they send two missionaries out. At, I think when they turn 18 or 19, they teach them how to te speak the language of wherever they're going and they send them out and they spend it two years in the community, spreading Mormonism. Uh, but they live there and amongst them, they speak their language and they work. So we were on the job site working with the locals, the local Church of God congregation there, small. We were building a church and these two Mormons came up and wanted to know if they could help. And of course we said, sure. And there they were in their white shirts and their black pants and they were laying brick and block just like us. And working alongside of us and and you know there were some snarky remarks from some who you know were didn't really appreciate Mormons being there in an evangelical mission field but at the same time I, I, I thought about them during this lesson and how that they themselves they didn't care that it was a um, uh, evangelical non-Mormon house of God going up they were there in the community wanting to work show themselves to be a part of the community take part in it, even if that was not part of their job. And I think when I remember those guys, I think back to what Jesus is telling them is you're going to go into these communities, you're going to integrate yourself in them. You know, you're going to sit there and they're going to, you're going to teach the gospel into these cities, but forever time, forever, how long you're going to stay there, you're going to, you're going to speak their language. You're going to preach to them and you're going to earn your way in whatever provisions they give you or that God provides. And he goes further because in one of the more confusing parts to me of this instruction that he gives these disciples, not only is he requiring them to heal the sick and cleanse the lepers, but take nothing with them. But when they go into the city, they're, they're, here's what they're supposed to do as far as providing accommodations. He says, and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter, he's giving it totally up to them, whatever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy and there abide till you go further or go thence or until you leave and whatsoever city or town you shall enter inquire who in it is worthy who in this city and town is receptive or who's of a good reputation that would be receptive to you staying with them you're going to have to have accommodations and where is that going to come from you have no money so do you go into anybody that will take you in? Do you go into the local saloon who's got rooms in the back and stay? No, you're going to find someone of a worthy reputation, someone that I am sure that God has already gone before you to open the door and provide a heart and a desire of someone who has said, I'll take you in. I don't know. We don't know at this point whether a disciple would go into these cities and towns and inquire amongst the synagogues or inquire amongst other individuals of who in the town is hospitable, who in the town has a place to a room and what type of person is this? I don't know who you would ask or how, but this is what these disciples are faced with into the town and city that they're going to integrate themselves and the place they've got to find a place to live. And Jesus is telling them to be careful that when you go, inquire on who is worthy. But we believe that God goes before us, as I said, and provides and paves the way to where I would imagine most of these disciples didn't have to look very far and struggle to find someone or the person that God had established to be there to welcome them into their home. And when you come into the house, salute it or give it peace. Peace be upon this house. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it not be worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you throughout the town or the city, nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. That was a Middle Eastern term, as we would say, just wash your hands of it. If you are rejected, if your gospel, if the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is rejected, if you're mocked, if they reject you totally, you've, you've done all that I've asked you to do, wash your hands of it, shake the dust off your feet and leave and don't let it burden you. Don't let it get you discouraged and down. 
This will be, you, you'll probably run into this more than you'll run into receptive ears. Don't be discouraged when you have it. Just wipe the dust right off your feet. Shake it right off your feet because that will be a reproach against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city that's rejected you. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's encouraging. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Interesting balancing act there. I'm going to send you as sheep among wolves. Wolves are there to destroy the sheep, to look for the one that's, that's, uh, that's weak and attack. And that's what you're going to run into because you are preaching the kingdom of heaven in a world full of legalism. In a world full of a dominant religion that says it's got to be this way, the Old Testament way, the law of Moses' way, and the Pharisaic way, and nothing else. Anything new, we're going to snuff it out. The wolves that he's talking about, unfortunately, are the religious people of the day. These disciples, when they go to these cities and towns and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of heaven, the very ones that are going to attack them are going to be the religious leaders of the day who believe totally within their heart that this message is dangerous to them. It's dangerous to the established church and will have nothing to do with it. The, the, the very religious leaders who have, should have seen Jesus coming, who should have recognized Jesus, are the very ones who had hardened themselves so, so severely that they're going to reject and even attack the disciples, the sheep that Jesus is sending forth. So he tells them to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wise as serpents. Serpents, uh, when I was studying this, it was interesting that serpent is one of the only animals that everything hates. Think about that. Everything from the animal kingdom to humans hate snakes. Very strange people maybe like snakes, but most people don't like snakes. And animals don't even like snakes. Snakes are constantly being attacked. So they have to become very cunning. In order to survive, they have to be wise. They have to be perceptive of where the danger is. And what Jesus is, is supposedly saying here is that even though I'm sending you forth as sheep among wolves, be perceptive, be alert, be aware. Don't go into a situation unaware and just put yourself out there to where you're going to be attacked easily. Be as wise as a serpent, elusive, aware, and wise knowing how to react as circumstances come upon you. Be wise in that, in that way, but also you are to be as harmless as doves. You're not to attack back. You're not to have revenge. You're not to get into arguments. You're not, as, you're not going to fight your way into the, these, these, uh, the hearts and minds of individuals. You're as harmless as a dove. You are to escape the part that is attacking you and come out in a different location. This is the harmlessness. It's a balancing act of being cunning, wise, and perceptive, but also being harmless, innocent, and uh, trying to get away from, uh, from, from arguing. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Two things here, the councils and the synagogues. That means that you may be attacked by not only the religious leaders of the day, which is where they got the most of the attack, but maybe even the civic organizations, the locals, the local um, um, governmental organizations there that may not like the gospel that you're spreading. It may not be as strong. You know, the, the, the religious leaders are going to scourge you. They're going to whip you. They're going to try to attack you physically. The civic organizations may say, get out here in our town, get somewhere else. We don't want all that, all that stuff going on here. But both sides may be an opposition to you. This is If you're a disciple, this is what you have to look forward to. Spreading this new gospel of Jesus Christ. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, Take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. I was reading it, and in the study it said that one of the biggest fears of a disciple was not necessarily provisions, you know, uh, uh, speaking the, the gospel or whatever. It's, it's what to do or what to say when you're confronted. 
the confrontation, the debate, um, you know, the, the attack, how do we react? I'm not good at, at playing defense or I'm not, I'm not good at fighting. I'm not good at, in, in pressure situations. That was one of the biggest fears they had was these were not, these were what we call unlearned men. They, they were just, they, they were not men of, of um, philosophical means. They couldn't stand toe to toe with people and, and argue or not normally. And Jesus, who's telling them, them, I know that you're just common men with common jobs and you love me and you're following me and I'm sending you out to be attacked as sheep among wolves. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to bring you in front of their councils. And what, do you, what is this you're teaching? What is this you're preaching to us? You know, how dare you come into this city? And, and that was one of their biggest fears. What am I going to say? How am I going to make sense of all this? And Jesus is telling them not to worry about it. That whatever, if they find themselves in that situation, that their Father in heaven, the Spirit of the Lord, will be upon them to teach them what to say. That's comforting and encouraging because they've gotten to the point now where they trust the Lord. They trust Jesus. They've seen him. They've, he's, he's never lied to them. He's preached the gospel to them. They, they're following him. They understand him. They, they trust him. And now he's given them the biggest assignment they've ever had or ever can conceive. So he's teaching them, you're, you're going to have to trust me. Not only with your provisions, not only where, you're going to, where your accommodations are going to be, not only with everything that you're, you're going to be doing as far as cleansing the lepers and healing the sick, but you're going to have to trust that the Spirit of the Lord is going to be upon you when you're brought up before the councils and these synagogues and, 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 and uh, demanded for, for uh, answers. Don't worry about it. The answer will come to you there as you trust in me. That's quite a task, but you can see where these disciples are realizing that if we put our total trust in God, if he's going to provide all these other things, by the time we get into these synagogues, we're going to have total trust in him providing the answers as well. For it says that, fear them not, fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. For, for what, I what I tell you in darkness, that is what I want you to speak in light, in the open. And what you hear in the ear, what is speaking in your ear, I want you to preach it upon the housetops. It's an interesting description of what Jesus is telling them. Don't take any thought of any of these things, even to the point of what to say. Because the Holy Spirit is going to give you the things to say. And for those things that I would tell you in mysteries, in the darkness, you know, Jesus had this, um, when he began his ministry, he spoke to the masses and the multitudes as plain, plain talk. He would teach them like, like we're talking, conversation, they understood it fully. But as the multitudes grow, grew and the uh, Pharisees got wind of this new guy that's out in the plains teaching and preaching the gospel, the kingdom of heaven, and they start going in and sending their people into these masses and attacking and criticizing and, and all of that, the masses grow to a point where only a portion of them truly are wanting to follow Jesus and another portion of them are wanting to attack him and deny him and mock him and tell everybody else, oh, this is, this is baloney, don't believe any of it. Jesus begins to speak in parables through his ministry. As he starts out talking plain to them, he then switches over to start speaking in parables to the masses. And it's interesting because these are mysteries that are hidden, but only those who truly have an ear to hear, as he would say, let them hear. Those who truly had a desire to know the truth, to know the spirit of truth, and they would listen to Christ and their heart was open to Christ, it would be revealed to them what these mysteries of parables, these parables meant. You know, the disciples even asked Jesus what it, what it was. Why do you speak to people in parables? And he would, he would tell them that it was, it was uh, because it was not for them to, um, it, let me just read it. It says, the disciples came and said to him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? They've heard him speak plain, plain English, <laughs> plain talk to, the, to everybody. Why are you now speaking to everybody in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. They're hearing the parables. They're hearing, and he's also given explanation to them of the parables. But to them it is not given. 
He's talking in the masses that are coming to him. So many of them are there, not with the de desire to learn from Christ, but to mock him. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more in abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that which he hath. It's all about the desire of your heart. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because they seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand, because their heart's not open to it. It's hard for us to understand what Christ knew at the time. The best example I, I, I learned or that I read was if you take wax and clay. Um, wax and clay, they typically start out in the same type of a texture. You can kind of put your fingers in it. It's gooey and it's moldable and pliable. But if you put both of them outside and let the sun hit them, the wax will melt and become even more pliable. Talking about, and then this is an example of, of your heart, wax heart or a clay heart. The same sun that melts the wax and makes it more formable will harden the clay. Same type of texture, but when that sun hits both of them, the same amount of energy comes on them. One becomes softer, one becomes harder. The clay becomes so much harder that you can't even put a shovel in it. But the same message, the same sun coming down has two different consequences on these two very like textures and what the parables were doing is those that had the heart that were open and soft and was ready to receive truth from the master understood the parables they could hear the parables and they could go home and ponder that and they would understand what he was meaning the ones that would only become hardened they didn't want their hearts weren't ready for for this message they didn't want to hear it in any way they would hear these parables and walk away and say that guy's crazy that didn't make a bit of sense. Oh, he just talks in riddles. None of this makes any sense. He did it on a purpose because he was truly trying to reach those who truly wanted to hear. And the ones that were out to attack him and destroy him, instead of giving them information that would make them even hate him more, he left them where they were walking away thinking he was a foolish person. Parables. But what he's telling the disciples is your job is not to speak necessarily in parables here. He is warning them, it's been revealed to you. What I tell you in darkness, what I speak to your heart, that's what you're going to speak in light. You're going to, you're going to speak out what, I, what you hear from me, and you're going to preach it upon the housetops. This is something that Christ is wanting them to understand. Total dependence. Total dependence on the Savior. Total dependence on the Lord opening doors, providing for them from the, time they, from the time they leave, not even taking a change of clothing, not knowing where they're going to sleep that night when they enter into this town, not even knowing what they're going to preach necessarily. They know they're going to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but not knowing what to say in front of the synagogues and the councils. And when men attack them, not knowing what to say, but even when they're preaching, they are to rely upon what they hear from him. That hasn't changed. You know, the men of God who preach the word today, they still hear from the spirit of God to teach and to preach to us what they hear. That's, that hasn't changed. That's still something, even though we have the gospel, the word of the Lord he, you know, he's given us the advantage. They didn't have the gospel to go by. They couldn't walk in the town with a book and say, turn into in scripture here and we're going to read it and, and preach on it. That's a benefit we have and thank God for it. But they had to totally rely upon the Holy Spirit revealing unto them what it is to preach and how to do this. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. He's telling you, you're going to be persecuted. I'm going to go ahead and tell you, after all this reliance upon the Lord, there are going to, be, there are going to come times when you're still going to be persecuted and beaten and, and whipped. But don't fear them which can only kill you physically. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And I would rather serve the Lord than serve man because man can only kill my body. The Lord can abandon my soul. And destroy my soul. And I will not allow that to happen. 
He says, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, which is very cheap, or is it, it's the, you know, sparrows, he's trying to let them know a sparrow is a, not a worthless bird, but the smallest of all birds in value. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father, without him noticing it. When you feel like you're being, when you are being persecuted, when you're feeling like everything's coming against you, and you realize that I'm a nobody, even a sparrow that falls to the ground is noticed by its creator, Father, the, you know, Father God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. What encouraging words he's telling them. After everything he's taught them that they're going to be doing, their total reliance upon the Father, some of them can be listening to this and being worried or discouraged, but he's giving them encouragement at the end that even the very hairs of your head are numbered. God knows everything about you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows the plans he has for you. He knows how you're going to walk this path. And his desires, if you trust him, if you lean upon him, and not your own understanding, but you walk with him, it'll, he'll make your path straight. Because he loves you and cares for every part of you. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. They were, you know, here in America, we talk about this a lot, how that when we talk and have a lesson on persecution, it's hard to have that lesson in America where we're so blessed. We are so blessed, especially in this section of the country where, you know, even people who don't go to church will respect, um, I say that, that around this community anyway, if, if you're a church-going person, you're respected, you're, you're acknowledged, you're not persecuted or insulted very often. If, you know, I don't know if I've ever been insulted or persecuted for my stand for Christ. And I'm lucky for that. I'm thankful to the Lord that I'm, I was born here and raised here. It's a blessing. But as I was reading this, they gave some statistics that even in today's world, uh, there's, there's organizations that, that take statistics of people who are truly persecuted throughout the world. And it said that there are two, right now there's 260 million. Now I know there's 7 billion people on the earth, but 260 million Christians that are living in places with high levels of persecution. 260 million people may have to live in areas where they have to go to church underground, meet in secret places, not let their Bibles be seen, take it in their closet and read and study and pray, not let their neighbors hear them. Levels of persecution, 260 million people face that every day. In 2019, just three years ago, 3,000 Christians were killed for their faith worldwide. 3,000 fellow brothers and sisters were killed simply for their faith in Jesus Christ. Persecution. Same year, 9,500 churches were attacked worldwide. And 3,700 believers were either arrested or imprisoned for their faith. Persecution still happens. You know, when Jesus said that he, uh, he, he uh, acknowledged that the kingdom of heaven was like a mustard seed that a farmer planted, it's the very smallest seed there is, he plants it in his garden. And as it grows, it grows to be a tree in the garden. The largest uh, part of the garden, from the smallest to the largest, to a point where even the birds of the air will nest in its branches. He likens that to the kingdom of heaven. Out of these individuals that he sent forth in this 10th chapter of Matthew, he is telling them, if you follow me, if you trust me, if you lean upon me, then out of the seed that I have planted and your water will come this incredible kingdom and we see it now with the millions upon millions of individuals and even those that are being persecuted daily throughout our world where we're not faced with it. Even those that are being faced with it, they're part of the same kingdom and it's part of the same message. You can preach this message anywhere in the world. And that's the key about the kingdom of God. That's the key about the gospel. If there's a gospel out there that you can't preach everywhere, then you shouldn't preach it anywhere. If the same gospel, there's gospel messages out there about being wealthy and prosperous and things like that. If you can't preach that in the jungles of the world, just preach what you can preach everywhere. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a spiritual kingdom. It is huge. We are now in the, in the midst of this giant tree. We're a part of this giant tree that grew out of a small seed. And though many of our members get persecuted and killed and imprisoned, we still are going on. And even in today's world, we may not be physically persecuted. We may not be physically attacked, but there's persecution types, maybe not even insults hurled at us, but just rejections 
It could be from family members. It could be from your own family where you try to, to, to uh, part of persecution can be that you are a convert of Christianity and you go to your family. I have found Christ. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. And your family reject it. That's a type of persecution and re rejection is a type of persecution. We're all persecuted, maybe not to the point of death or imprisonment or attack, but persecution for standing for Christ is always there and prevalent no matter where we are. But he's telling us to take heart. He told his first disciples to expect it and not fear those that bring it. Wash your hands of anybody that rejects your message and your, 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 your honesty and, your, and the gospel that you preach. And keep on going, but trust in him with everything that you have. Asking for nothing in return, freely you, get, you, you receive salvation, freely you're going to give the message out. And that's the purpose of what we are commanded to do as disciples of Christ. That's our instruction still, is we didn't pay for our salvation, and the message that we heard was given to us freely, and we're going to give it out freely, the same way. Next week, we're going to continue again into the marks of a true disciple. How can you notice them? How can they see us? What, well, how will people know that we're a true disciple by just an interaction with us? We'll see you then. I wish you a good week.